Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. But well, we have a treat for you today. We're going to go down to Nantucket and take a look at some of the New Yankee projects that we've built over the years. And then we'll discover this wonderful rustic French side table. So it's off to Nantucket and then back side table. That's next right here in the New Yankee Workshop. Well, I always like to visit this place. I get to see some of the antiques that inspired pieces that I've made, as well as check out some of the reproductions I've built to see how they're doing. Now, here's one piece. It's a pantry table. We found this in an antique shop over in England, just outside of London. You might recognize this piece. It's a Nantucket settle, all old, distressed pine. The one that I made was made with cherry. Now, here's one of the reproductions that I did. It's a Victorian kitchen table made out of longleaf southern yellow pine. This is all reclaimed timber. It's beautiful wood, and it's really holding up quite well. Now, over here on this wall, we see a really distressed piece made out of pine. It's called an English server. And we actually found this in an antique shop in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I was lucky enough to find some good old pine timbers to build a reproduction of that. Over here, one of the larger pieces that I made, this long table. It's about 10 feet long. It was inspired by a piece we found in Napa, California. The top is made out of some old planks, and the frame and legs, again, are the longleaf reclaimed pine. Over here, one of the painted pieces that I made, a break front cabinet, and that seems to be holding up pretty well. One of the smaller pieces and one of the few chairs that I've done is this shaker ladder back chair, and we actually set this seat in place, these canvas tapes, and that's holding up pretty well. A teak bar with louvered doors, and this has had a lot of use at parties here, in the storage down below. But the piece I want you to see today, our next great find is this French country table. Now, it's made out of some kind of hardwood, a fruit wood like pear or maybe walnut or cherry. It has these cabriole legs, which are very graceful, and a small storage drawer that, boy, I don't know what they were thinking. It's one of the ruggedest little drawers that I've seen. Very thick sides, solid wood bottom, but it does have a dovetail at the front making the connection. Now, the top is interesting. It's thin. It's only about five-eighths of an inch thick. It's boards glued together, no breadboard edge, but they did do a little mold detail all around the edges. What I like about it is its size. It's just perfect as a little side table. So I think we'll take a few measurements, and this will be our next project. Well, I was able to pry away the antique from the Nantucket so we could bring it here to the shop and really look it over. And at closer inspection, this piece is really rustic. Look at the top. The boards have kind of cupped. Someone's shaved away at it around this knot. This piece has a real wild grain in it. And I was surprised to see that the top is secured with nails, and then the holes were just filled over. Some of these boards are not even straight. They're tapered. For instance, this one is wider here than it is down here. When I started to look at these legs, I discovered that every one was different, a slightly different shape, and if I rub my hand on it, it's kind of wavy. It's not very refined. So this is definitely a very rustic piece. Now, my prototype is a little more refined, but maybe it'll get some character with years of use. Made out of walnut, this top is three boards glued together and I was able to make a nice groove around the edge, much like the antique. The legs are these graceful cabriole legs, which add a lot of character to the piece. So if you'd like to build your own French side table, a measure drawing is available with the materials list, and you'll hear more about that before the program ends. Now for the wood, we turn to our friend Sam Sherrill out in Cincinnati. And you might recall, we did a program a few years ago where he runs a group called Trees to Furniture. They go around looking for trees that might be a public threat, 
or are knocked down in a storm. They're really urban trees. They bring in a portable sawmill and they slab it into boards, make it available to woodworkers. And look at what he sent me. These nice, thick pieces of walnut. And look at this one. Almost perfectly clear, not a knot. And that's very unusual for walnut. And to think that these boards or these trees that he got this wood from were moments from the landfill. Thanks, Sam, for sending us some more great wood. Now, after I take this wood and run it through my joiner and my surface planer, I get boards like this. These three will be the top for the table we're going to build today. I try to match them for grain and texture, and I think we've come pretty close on that. The next step is to joint these edges so that I get a nice tight joint when I glue it up. That's the trip to the joiner. Before we use any power tools, let's talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. A couple passes through the joiner should true up that edge. All right, now it's time to glue them up. And I'm just rolling on a carpenter's glue. This one happens to be a dark wood glue. That way the seam will be totally invisible. And you'll also note that I'm not using any biscuits in this top. There's not going to be a lot of stress on these joints. And if they were to fail later, that's not the worst thing in the world. I mean, that's what happened to the antique. The other reason that I don't use biscuits in a top is that we've discovered that occasionally the wood in the area of the biscuit shrinks and it telescopes through it, sort of leaves a little bit of a divot. And that doesn't look very good on a top, so we're not going to use any here today. Okay, set this aside to dry, and we'll start working on the legs. Here's a blank that I glued up, a couple thick pieces, and here's one of the legs. Now, I need a blank this large because if I put the leg along one area of the corner, and you'll see that as it goes down to the bottom, I'm going to use up the whole width of this blank. It's about three and a half inches square. I'm going to take it out of the clamps and bring it over to the joiner and true up an edge. The fence on my joiner is exactly 90 degrees to the table. I'm going to take this flat surface and rest it up against that fence. And when I run it through the joiner, that corner will end up being perfectly square. Now I have three edges the way I want. I'll put that jointed edge against the fence and rip it, and then run it again through the joiner. Let's take another look at the sample leg. The first thing that I want to machine are the mortises for the rails. And I suppose I could shape it first and then figure out a way to support the leg so that as I bring my chisel down, I get a nice straight mortise. But it's a lot easier to do it while the blank is still square and straight. So here's our blank, and I want to do the layout. Here's a template that I made out of quarter-inch plywood. I lay it on the piece, flush with the corner, and I like to use a piece of wood for support. And now you can see why the blank has to be so large. We're going from that back corner right to this corner. It's a lot of wood, but this is the way they're traditionally cut. I hold it in place, use a fine tip pen, ink, and mark it. Okay, now I rotate the blank. I'll rotate the sample leg around, take the template, rotate it, set it on the corner, and lay it out. Now where the straight part of the leg meets the curve, I'm going to bring a line around. Now I'm marking the top of the leg. All right, this line indicates the top of the mortise. And this, the bottom of the mortise. 
now let's dig it out. The bit will remove most of the material. The chisel will square it up. The first cut I want to make is to form this square portion at the top of the leg. So I've set up a straight edge as a fence and a stop. I'll run the piece in, it'll cut that face and stop just shy of the curve. Then I can rotate it and cut the other side. Now we'll just cut off the waist. Now I'm ready to cut the curved shape. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this outside line first, and I'm going to stop just shy of the end. I'll shut the machine down, carefully back it out, then I'll cut the other side, again, stopping shy, shutting down, backing it out. I need to leave those pieces on so they'll provide support while I cut the other side. I also want to cut this as accurately as possible. It'll save time in the final shaping of the leg. Okay, now I just want to spread it a little bit to take the pressure off the blade and slide it out. Okay, carefully back it out again. Now we have the support remaining that I need to cut the other curves. There it is, all roughed out. I've set up a few of my clamps to hold the leg securely as I start to refine the shape. And I'm starting with this rasp. I want to get the initial roughness from the cuts off. And then I'll switch over to my sander with some 80 grit paper. On the square part of the leg, I've taken a scrap block, wrapped it with some 80 grit, and I'll sand this totally by hand. For the final sweetening of the piece, I'm using a cabinet scraper, a flexible piece of steel. It has a little burr on the edge, and what it does is it just shaves off a very small amount of wood, making the piece nice and smooth. Well, now I want to make the tenons on the end of the rails to fit into those mortises. Here's a sample. What I've done is set up a stop block, set the blade to the right height, and I'll first make the shoulder cut by doing a pass on each side. Now I've raised the blade an eighth of an inch, and I'll nibble away at the top and bottom of each tenon. The last cut to form the tenon is called the cheek cut, it's these side cuts. And the safest way to do that is to use a tenoning jig. It holds the piece securely in place as I push it through the saw. Let's take a look at underneath the prototype. The back rail and the front rail both get two grooves. The one at the top is for the clips to secure the top, and the one at the bottom is for the draw supports. The side rails also need a groove at the top for some clips. Here at the table saw, I've set up the stack dado for quarter inch width, quarter inch height, and I can run those grooves. Take another look at the prototype. There's a decorative groove right at the bottom of each rail, and I'll do that at the router table. I've installed this decorative plunge bit in my router, and I'm just going to use a little bit of this tip. Now take a little bit of sandpaper and clean it out. There's a cutout in the front rail to make the drawer opening. So here's my blank with the layout. I'll make the cross cuts on the band saw. I'll make the rip cut with a small circular saw. I've loosened the depth adjustment on the saw. I've set it over the line, make a slow plunge cut in, then go to the other side and finish it off with a handsaw. 
I've just made a tenon at the end of this piece of poplar that will fit into the grooves I made in the rails. Once this is glued in place, it'll support the drop. All I do is nibble away the material with the saw blade. Finally, we're ready for some assembly. I've put some glue in the mortise and some on the tenon. And what I'm going to do is make two sub-assemblies first, the short rails. Okay, now we can slip in the long rails. Get those positioned. If the builders of that antique had glues like this, that piece would look a lot different today. Okay, now let's slip in these draw supports. Let's stick it in the back first. Bring it around. No need for brads here. The glue will do the job. Now on top of those draw supports, I'm going to put these three-quarter by three-quarter pieces of poplar, and they will guide the side of the draw. And those do get bratted in place. Well, while the base sits in the clamps for a while, let's turn our attention back to the top. It's dried nicely. I'll take a scraper and remove some of this excess glue. Now, I could have sanded this with my random orbit sander to get all the joints nice and smooth, but this is where a wide belt sander comes in real handy. Makes the panel perfectly flat and even. Now, using my homemade panel cutter, I'll cut the top to size. I'll take another look at the prototype, and you can see that this decorative groove stops short of going through the end. I want it to stay within the perimeter. The way to accomplish that is to use the same decorative bit, except now I've added some lines on my fence which define where it has to stop from the edge. So I'll plunge the piece onto it and stop within the lines. Okay, that's good. I can sand it and clean up the corners with a chisel. Well, good morning. I'm getting started today completing our top. I want to round over the edges. So for the top edge, I'm using a quarter inch radius bit. I'll do all four edges. For the underside, I'm going to raise the bit slightly for a little tighter radius. I have a couple defects in the walnut that I want to take care of. And I'm going to use a technique that I learned while we were in Tucson a few years ago at a place where they built furniture out of mesquite wood. Now, mesquite makes beautiful furniture. But as a wood, it has a lot of defects. So what they do is mix up two-part epoxy, color it black, and just fill those holes. Once it sets up and you sand it off so that it's smooth, it either looks like a little knot or a vein in the wood or just a shadow line. Here I'm beginning to form a clip to secure the top. Now I'll cut it off. After drilling a hole in the clip for a screw, I can now place them in the groove. And when I drive a screw through the clip into the top, those will hold it in place. Well, now it's time to turn our attention to the draw. The front is walnut, the sides are solid poplar, and the bottom is solid poplar. But I could have used plywood there. Now, the first thing that I want to do is make some rabbits, one on each end and a shallower one along the bottom. The parts of our draw are connected with dovetail joinery. Through dovetails in the back, half blind dovetails in the front. Now, I'm not going to use a fancy jig like this. All I'm going to use are some basic hand tools, a router, and a straight kite and bit. Now, here's the draw front, and I've already started to mark out where I want the pins. I made this little template. 
It's 11 degree cuts, which is typical for a dovetail. So I mark the half pin in the center. I'm going to have a full pin. And then on this side, another half pin. Now to get the depth of that, I'm going to take my side pieces, put one in the rabbit, one on the back, and then take a utility knife and make a score line. Now I want to transfer those marks to the score line. Now I'll be able to remove the bulk of the material with my router. Now I'll just take a chisel and clean it out to the lines. At this point, I can take my side piece and mark it out to cut the tails. Using a sharp utility knife gives me accurate marks and a place to set the chisel. Your only option here is to remove this material with a chisel, but be patient. With a little patience, you get a nice hand-cut dovetail joint. Now we need grooves in all four pieces to receive the bottom. Once again, I've used my decorative bit to put a little groove around the draw front. Now I'll round over the edges. Let's put it together. All right, now for the bottom. No glue here. All right, that's it. And I think I'll put a clamp on these back joints. All right, this piece is ready for the finishing room. I think one of the nicest finishes for walnut is a Danish oil. This one has a little bit of walnut pigment in it, so it'll make the piece a little bit richer. The idea is to flood on a coat, let it sit for 15 minutes or so, put on another coat, let that sit for about 20 minutes, and then wipe off any excess. After eight hours, you can give it a light sanding with some wet, dry paper and apply another coat using the same process. The more coats you put on, the richer it'll look. Well, here it is, our French side table with several coats of that Danish oil. And that walnut is really starting to look rich. It's a very elegant piece, just the right size. I think I'm gonna use this next to my bed as a bedside table. Now, let me show you what we're gonna build next time. It's right in here. It's called a wall-mounted tool chest. The idea is to get the tools up off the floor, organize them, make it safer to get to them, and keep them from banging into one another. And there's plenty of room for all your tools. It's a great project for the workshop, so I hope that you'll join me next time and build one together right here in the New Yankee Workshop.